But what we're going to do is we're going to do is mostly to start to again start our connect out, just like I did yesterday. We started with the global Olympiad, and, and then, then James came in and looked at the, the, the methodology. Um, so again, we're going to start with examples of how companies have actually designed measures, and then present it with the difficult, difficult set of balls, which is no longer issues. Um, to them and by them. So, just to be completely clear, uh, and for the people that are not here, you're going to explain this to them. Um, there are two kinds of measures at the moment. And the easiest thing to do is to think of income publicity. Um, Mark Margani said that on Monday, he got over $5 million and his proposals were a new relative measure. That is a comparable measure. Well, it's comparable as you can be at the moment. Um, so, so it's, it's an international comparable measure. Um, that is, is it's all 25 a day, the PPP is supposed to mean roughly the same thing in every, every country for which it is important. Comparable, international comparable measures, for example, are used in many of the implementing development goals, um, and they enable countries to compare how fast they are moving versus other countries. And so it can be useful um, in tracking progress and learning from different situations. Um, and in the case of the MPI, um, it's much easier to go subnational than it is with income property. So as you've seen yesterday, you can also compare regions of Nigeria, countries, South Sudan, or whatever, and look at subnational groups, like ethnic groups that have stop presenting or changes over time. So this, in a sense, is, is the global MPI. And now we're turning to a different kind of measure, which is a national measure. So, so just, just like, like there's, there's a global law of society, and Martin, and this is carefully said that no government on earth uses it, uh, proposed that they use national measures designed by their citizens' offices um, that really reflect the policy priority the design criteria uh, of the countries. And so the national are much more important than the global um, because there is a policy. Um, and in the case of the global MPI, as we say, when it comes to the national MPIs, um, it can be used much more directly for, for different kinds of policies. And we'll give some examples of this. So um, somebody mentioned Sandy, um, the South Africa MPI, um, and there, there are some others. So what I'd like everyone to first of all do is go away and remember this thing because it's one of the most common confusions we find, that people confuse a global MPI and a national MPI. And so if you can be very clear on this distinction and ask us if you're not, that would be very helpful. Um, because the national MPI is being context specific, have different numbers of indicators, different dimensions, um, different purposes, different frequencies of being updated. Um, and, and so they're much more sense, flexible and agile. So what we're going to do is present some of the, local, the official national multidimensional property indices. That is, they are official statistics of the country, they're updated regularly, they're used for policies. We're going to do this in a couple of different ways. One is we're going to go through the structure of the different measures. And that will give you an idea of how different countries choose dimensions, indicators, cutoffs, weights. What we learned from James goes in to the, the measure at the end. And so you'll see some examples of how they have made and why they have made these normative decisions. So each of us, Sal Fabiana or Cicera, Christoph, and Paola, will present measures but also their normative, you know, why was the public cut off set here? Why was this space shift? So that will give you ideas as you're designing your own measures for whatever purposes. Um, of things you might want to do or absolutely not do, depending on the case. Then the other thing we're going to do today is already start to show you how some of the measures are used to policy. And the reason we do it now is because when you are designing a measure, you also might want to think, not only is this an indicator in my survey, not only uh, is it you know, technically solid, uh, not only is it within the dimension that I'm thinking about, but also you cannot change it by policy. So let me give you an example. Illiteracy. 
I might say that you are deprived of any member of your household is illiterate. Now, if you look at the profile of illiterate people across age, you might find that most illiterate people are 70 and above, 60 and above. They're, they might be elders of the community. If they are elders of the community and they are illiterate, that indicator will never go down by policy. It will go down by demographic change. So what that means is that if you want a measure that's responsive to policy, you need either literacy of the workforce, or if there's a lifelong learning program, an adult literacy program, you'd want to make sure to get that information so that you can track how it goes down by, by policy. So we're going to go through, in each case, a little bit of how um, the measures are used in policy. Some of them, like Chile, are too new yet um, to, to have much in that way. Um, but that will mean that when you're starting to think about either your, your exercising groups or your own work outside groups, you can already start to think about what policy uses you might want your measure to influence. And if so, how it could do its job best. You know what I'm saying? How is it going to be policy responsible? So I'm going to start with the example of Colombia. And uh, in a sense, and go through all of those in most detail, Colombia followed by Mexico, because those are um, the two measures that have been embedded in many different aspects of the policy framework. And then um, go to Bhutan and Chile. So these are slides which are used with permission from the government of Colombia, um, two parts of government, the Department of Nacional the Planning Department, and from the Social Prosperity Department. So the, the MPI um, has, in a, according to this, this government that is presenting it, different um, aspects that seem to be clearly key. One is that it, in a sense, is a fit with the objectives of national policy. And Colombia's measure was designed um, as Colombia's national development plan was designed. So its national development plan was launched in 2010. Its MPI was launched in 2011. And so the indicators, as we'll go through, all reflect goals in the national development plan. The second purpose is to coordinate public policy across sectors. We already talked about how sectors sometimes don't want to talk to each other. Um, they don't want to coordinate. And it can be difficult. But this is a goal for Colombia because it's more cost effective if the sectors collaborate and coordinate with each other. The third goal that they had was the monitoring of policy. Colombia, um, uh, the president was elected and came into office with a big desire to make an imprint on poverty. And so actually set a goal when the MPI was launched to reduce the MPI within a four year time span. And he said how many people and what percentage of poverty there should be at the end of it. And in order to realize that, that aim, they needed the measures to be monitored. And I should say that Colombia's measures updated every year annually using the uh, survey of quality of life or conditions of life. And then last, they wanted it to inform decision making. And I will just uh, give a brief example of geographic targeting, but I can talk about the others. So let's go through each of these. First, the fit to the objectives of social policy. I already mentioned that um, the national plan, in the case of Colombia, is the, the key document um, for the MPI. Um, and their starting point was to improve the instruments and methodologies of poverty measurement. So um, one of the motivations in the case of Colombia for looking at the multidimensional poverty measure was not multidimensional poverty, it was income poverty. And they had a problem. And the problem was that the statistics office had changed the survey. And so they could not complete their series of the income poverty. They had a gap and they didn't know what their income poverty was over a period of time. And this created quite a bit of consternation and pressure on the government. Um, and so that in a sense created an opening. And uh, it's interesting I mentioned that because Chile a few years later had a similar situation 
It also found multiple of the initiatives is good thing to do alongside the economy, partly just for safety, um, to, have, to have two measures at a time when, when their income poverty measure was um, being questioned quite a bit. Um, and then the other was to, they wanted to have a strategy that included both the economic and the social uh, sectors, and so using income and multidimensional measures. So their measure has five dimensions. Global NPI had three dimensions, this has five. Education, we've seen in the global NPI. Health, we've seen in the global NPI. Some of this is a, sort of like living standards. But they add work or employment or labor, and they add a dimension of childhood and youth conditions. So those are the five dimensions. As I said, these dimensions are conceptual. They don't go in the matrix. The matrix are indicated. But these were also sort of chapters of the National Development Plan, as were. They were organizing concepts of the development plan. So each of these five dimensions is equally weighted, and it is represented by a series of indicators, and there are actually 15 indicators. And within each dimension, each indicator is equally weighted. So if this is 20% and there are five indicators, each one is 4%, 20% and two, so each one is 10%, and so on. Um, as I mentioned, these 15 indicators were all in the National Development Plan, um, and the weight citizens, as you see, are a bit arbitrary and equal within them. So how do they justify the selection variables? Um, in addition to the, the fact that each indicator had to reflect goals in the National Development Plan, there were three criteria for selecting the variables. The first was that they wanted indicators that were frequently used nationally or internationally, um, and in a sense seemed to be rigorous by quite a wide variety of experts on the different subjects. Um, so they wanted, a, this is basically a criteria of rigor and precision. The second is the one that I mentioned, which is they needed to be able to be affected by public policies. So the literacy example would not be. Um, each of their indicators can be checked, um, and they can be affected by public policies. And the final one is that <coughs> they wanted the information already available in their survey. So they limited their national measure to the data in the survey. And they did that because they had an interruption in their income series. And so they wanted to be able to go back in time for multidimensional poverty and show multidimensional poverty across time, spanning the period when they had a gap in the income series. There's also, again, a sense of confidence if you can see previous trends, then you're not so scared of what might happen when you update. That's not essential. So Mexico and other countries have done a new service and launched their measure to start a new survey. Uh, so both are possible, but in the case of Colombia, they wanted to go back in time. And then they also um, used the coefficient of variation to check that the variables were valid uh, in the sample and in the, in the ways that they were using the sample. And for them, um, they had, if it's less than 15%, then it's acceptable. Um, and beyond that, there's a, there's a little bit of a gray area. Um, but, but not beyond that. So this is a bit of a technical criteria. This is a policy criteria, this is a data criteria, and this is a sort of rigor academic literature criteria. How did they set the cutoff? So the cutoff K, um, this is a simplified slide because it's for a couple of presentation on experts. So you've already seen that the indicators are not equally related. So you already know that K will be a shared percentage. But if they are sharing this in the public, um, they didn't get into those details. So this is technically inaccurate, but it shares the intuition um, accurately. And so it was good enough for the purposes. 
So they, they looked at the median number of deprivations and the need um, in 2008, um, which was the year before they, they, the last survey they had when they launched um, was 2010. And they looked at a subjective property question, do you perceive that you are poor? Do you consider yourself to be poor? And then for people who were poor, they looked at their CI score. What's the CI score? It was both at the national level 
and then other parts of government. But um, that's the president of Colombia, um, and he set up a um, round table where he was present, and the ministers were present, and they could not send delegates. They had to be present in person. And it was the ministers themselves that then looked at a stoplight depiction. Again, this is very simple. A stoplight depiction of the 15 indicators in the five dimensions of Colombia's MPI. And they saw, okay, this one's going okay, but look here. Unemployment and formal employment, they're not changing. What do we need to do? You know, this is 2011, this is 2012. Oops, you know, not much change. Or an increase in, in this case. And it was statistically significant. Oops, oops, bad, bad. Okay, what do we do? Um, so that's just a very simple example of how it's being used. And of course, that also was cascaded to different levels of government. Can this also have the scope of happening that those, peop those people who are closer to the K value would be you know, the same argument which you have for the income poverty, mm -hmm. where closer to the poverty line they would escape and so many millions of people can come out of poverty with little effort. The same way the people who are deprived in less dimensions, if we focus on them, you can make more people come out of poverty. Yeah, so I'm ending Colombia, we'll go to Mexico. And in the case of Mexico, you'll see the number, the intensity being reported because that's how you check that, to look at changes in intensity. The only thing I'll mention in closing is that um, Colombia also used it, for example, to change their geographic targeting. This was the initial distribution. And 11 of the 15 indicators in the national MPI are present in the census. And so they were able, using census data, to make MPIs at the municipal level. And they used the maps at the municipal level um, to change their geographic targeting. So those are just some of the policy uses. So that's the first example. And now I hand over to somebody, um, I'm not sure who, to do yes. Mexico. Gisela, who will be doing it by Skype. She's one of our colleagues, but she's currently in Costa Rica. But she will have you for the next 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, participants. I apologize because I couldn't join you in Washington. Uh, but I still want to contribute uh, a little to, to the summer school effort by presenting the case of the multidimensional poverty index in Mexico, uh, which I'm sure some of you uh, in the audience know much better than uh, I do. Um, this is taken from Hernando uh, Ligona and Gonzalo Tibosio's slides, which are available at the Conneval and MPVN website. Um, it's the, the level of my voice right so um, people can hear me over there? Yes. yes. Great. Thank you very much. So the case, uh, the multidimensional poverty index uh, in Mexico took almost 10 years to, um, uh, to, to get ready. From 1999, when the Congress started to discuss the uh, project of law uh, until it became a law in 2004, and the first steps were, were taken uh, to construct the measure, which was first published in 2009. Uh, it was a 10-year process in which uh, very important normative decisions were made. The first one was that dimensions and indicators established in the general law were justified as being constitutional rights protected by the uh, Constitution uh, for every Mexican. The unit of analysis is the individual, although many of the indicators uh, in the index are built at household level. We will see that uh, we will see uh, the specific indicators in a second. And because the general law included uh, indicators that were not, uh, for which information was not gathered before in Mexico, and no survey uh, in common expenditure survey or uh, household survey was taken and adapted with new questions to form, um, to start uh, gathering information for this index. So how does the Mexican government define multidimensional uh, poverty? Well, this is uh, a person is multidimensionally poor if he or she experiences in 
social deprivation, one or more social deprivation, and if he and she doesn't have the e income enough to buy a food basket and non-food basket. So in this diagram, you can see in the horizontal axis, the social deprivation or social uh, rights that people are um, are not having, and which include uh, education, health, social security, uh, quality of living, access to basic services, and access to food. And on the vertical axis, you can see the income poverty line, uh, which is uh, and, and this diagram forms a quadrangle. The rectangle, the orange rectangle on the left, uh, left uh, hand side indicates that people living in multidimensional uh, poverty because they are under the poverty, income poverty line and they experience one or more social deprivation. In the meantime, people above the poverty line, income poverty line, but experiencing more, more than one social deprivation are in this rectangle. And people experiencing no social deprivation are in the white uh, uh, rectangle on the right hand side. More importantly, the, uh, the Cotevall has also defined an extreme poverty group. Which, uh, which suffers uh, even more acute income poverty. They are below an extreme poverty, income poverty line, and they suffer uh, three or more social carences, uh, social deprivations at the same time. And other groups of the population include uh, people vulnerable to uh, uh, due to social deprivations, such as the ones uh, located in the top white right angle, and, and people vulnerable due to income be, because they are below the income poverty line in this white uh, right uh, rectangle. And people living in Nirvana, which is the uh, green rectangle at the top right corner. As, uh, as I mentioned, uh, they Multidimensional poverty in Mexico includes uh, the income poverty line, which is defined based on a food basket with a minimum caloric intake and, and a non-food basket that includes other necessary goods and services such as health, education, transportation. And this uh, economic well-being dimension has an uh, effective weight of 50% of the uh, total deprivations in the index. In addition to this economic well-being dimension, there are six social, uh, um, social rights that should be also considered as indicators in the index. Uh, which include educational gap. A person is deprived in educational gap if he or she is aged between 3 and 15 years old and is not attending school, or if he is aged 16 years or older and is, uh, has not attained the level of education that was in force when he or she was born. People can also be deprived in access to health services if they are not uh, entitled to any of the uh, health insurance or health services available in the country, such as in Seguro Popular or other um, health institutions. People can also be deprived in access to social security if social security is not provided by either direct access or due to their family and uh, employment conditions. People can also be deprived in housing uh, and access to basic services such as water, drainage, electricity. And in the quality of uh, living uh, of, the, of the state in, the, in which they live, where roofs, walls, uh, floor, and overcrowded in 
evaluation. In addition to this, uh, the sixth indicator is access to food, in which uh, each member of the household should answer uh, the question if he or she has been in uh, suffering a hum hunger due to lack of income or lack, or lack of resources. Actually, the Mexican law also includes the dimension of total cohesion, but um, the policymakers found it very difficult to formulate an indicator that was representative at individual level. Remember, individual is the unit of analysis in this index uh, that represented the social cohesion. They just uh, were able to formulate social co cohesion at community level, and this the dimension is reported along with the results of the Mexican Poverty Index, but they are not uh, subscribed at in individual level. So as a result, we see that 9.5 uh, percentage of people in Mexico are under extreme poverty. 3.6 percent of people are under multidimensional uh, poverty. And altogether, they add up to 46.2% of multidimensional uh, poor people in Mexico suffering an average deprivation of 2.3 yeah. um, social deprivations. This is in 2000. Uh, the Mexican government also uh, was able to um, analyze the trends over time for this multidimensional poverty. And uh, fortunately, the trend indicates that multidimensional poverty has increased. This is the headcount uh, ratio for multidimensional poverty from 46.1% in 2010 to 46.2% in 2014. All this increase can be explained due to the uh, increase in uh, people below the income poverty line. This passed from 52% in 2010 to 53.2% uh, in 2014. Interestingly, the, the proportion of people um, that are, are suffering one or more social deprivation actually decreased over this time. But due to the fact that the Mexican index includes the income dimension with a weight of 50%, the total index is increasing, um, it has an increasing trend over the last five years. The index allows the Mexican government to uh, formulate intersectoral policy policies that cover several angles of the life of the uh, more um, uh, the, the, the most, uh, mostly deprived uh, people in Mexico, such as the uh, strategy, um, the, the national crusade against hunger. This includes uh, providing access to food to people in extreme poverty, and uh, it's also um, it's also considering to address uh, problems of obviously access to healthcare, educational gap, and also access to basic income. So the target population of this national crusade is the blue rectangle at the bottom left corner of this diagram, which includes seven million people in extreme poverty in extreme multidimensional poverty, they also suffer lack of access to have, uh, food. And the index also allows the government to evaluate the progress and uh, targeting this, uh, specifically this indicator of access to food. We can see that uh, there has been some progress in the first and second decile between 2012 and 2014, when they have seen the reduction of this 
uh, of, of, depri of deprivation in access to food for the uh, first two other uh, sets of income. But unfortunately, the impact in the rest of the in uh, the sets of income is questionable. Uh, on this is all what I would like to present this time for, for the uh, Mexican experience. I, I'm sure we will come back, uh, or you will come back to it uh, for the rest of the summer school. And do not hesitate to approach me or any of, of our colleagues, in, even your uh, colleagues that are participants as well in the summer school, which are very familiar with this experience. And thank you very much for listening. So, okay, um, <clears throat> so I will briefly present Bhutan's multidimensional poverty index. Actually, more or less all of the results and things I'm going to present can be found in Bhutan's multidimensional poverty index report, which was written by um, Bhutan's National Statistics Bureau. So, the report is online. If you're interested in that, you can get it and read it in more detail. So, um, <clears throat> just to give you some context, um, Bhutan conceptualizes um, development in a very holistic way and explicitly includes non-economic aspects of well-being into it. So um, overall, um, the Cross-National Happiness Index has, for example, nine domains and 33 indicators, and these domains are like psychological well-being, health, education, and time use. But Bhutan also has official poverty estimates and income estimates, but there's also a wide recognition that poverty is like well being multidimensional, and therefore they also wanted a multidimensional poverty index. Um, so the purpose of this measure, um, the NPI has been designed as a tool to provide a better way of designing programs that help deliberately to target the poor and to help and monitor all these programs. So it's hence considered also a yardstick to measure the progress in terms of poverty eradication, and the key objective of the MPI is, um, and the report is to produce a multidimensional index in addition to the standard income approach, and to provide additional information. So it's not meant to replace income again, but to provide additional information. It's a complement. And it's also, the MPI is also built to help compare districts in, in terms of poverty, and to help government and other stakeholders to focus their policies according to the specific, specific needs of the districts. Um, the unit of the analysis is the household, and the main reason is that the policies are also at the household level, so they want to measure the targets that kind of can measure that. Um, the data sources, so the main data source for the most recent estimates is the Bhutan Living Standard Survey from 2012. The survey followed the methodology of the World Bank's Living Standard Survey, but there are also past NPI calculations based on BMIS, which is a customized version of UNICEF's multiple indicator cluster survey, and the BLS is 2011. Um, all the data sets are designed to be representative at the district level and by rural and urban areas, so you can decompose at the district level. So coming to the indicators and the dimensions, um, first of all, the dimensions are the same as in the global MPI, so you have health, education, and living standard. Um, the choice of the indicators was affected by the BLSS data sets. Um, overall, there are 13 indicators this time. Eight indicators are the same as in the global MPI, but we also have three additional indicators. This one, access to roads, then land ownership and livestock ownership, um, all belong to the living standard category. Um, food security is, for example, used as a nutrition indicator because um, there was no other information on nutrition. And for example, the, uh, where's the housing? Housing additionally considers um, the condition of the wall and the roof, not only the floor. Um, the weighting structure is nested. First of all, each dimension has the same weight, one third. And the two indicators in the first two dimensions, again, have the same weight, so one sixth. For the living standard dimension, this is kind of it's a bit different. So the first six indicators um, have one seventh of the weight. And the remaining one sevenths of the dimension is assigned equally to the last three indicators. So, asset, livestock, and where's the third one? Yeah, so those three have a different weight. So, coming to the poverty cutoffs, um, so in order to identify the poor, Bhutan has then decided that people are deprived in at least 30.7% of the weighted indicators are considered as poor. 
But I also use a second cutoff um, of more than 50% to identify people who are intensely poor. The table again shows um, the results for the first cutoff, so for the 30.7% of the rated indicators. So the results for 2012 are we have a headcount of 12.7%, so 12.7% of the people identified as multidimensionally poor. Um, the intensity is A is 40.1%, so the poor are on average deprived in 40% of the rated indicators, and the MPI is then 0.051. So um, let us now take a look at the censored headcount ratios <coughs> and the contributions to the MPI poverty by the indicators. So first of all, for example, in when we see cooking food, 10.1% of the people are multidimensionally poor and deprived of cooking food. We also see, for example, that schooling, um, that 9.2% of the people live in households where, where people are deprived in schooling and multidimensionally poor. And we also see that schooling overall plays a very important role in the MPI has a high contribution. And overall, the education dimension contributes like 43.1% to overall poverty, even so the rate is only <coughs> one third. So that's really important. Um, overlap between income and multidimensional poverty. Um, first of all, we see that um, both <laughs> identify a similar share of people as poor. Once 12.7 percent, the other time 12 percent. However, we also see that only 3.2 percent of the people are actually identified as poor using both approaches. When we look, for example, at the 9.5 percent, these are the people who are multidimensionally poor but wouldn't have been identified using the income approach. So that's again additional information, so added value using the MP MPI. Um, this slide, I guess you've already seen it. So I've been presented it already on the first day. Um, this is a decomposition by regions and shows the income and the multidimensional poverty. And what you see is there's a big variation between income poverty and multidimensional poverty. The most extreme great game case is Gaza, where multidimensional poverty is highest, but income poverty more or less lowest. But there's also like big variation in those these two regions as well. Um, so coming lastly to the development of poverty, um, so what you see, we have two graphs here that show the national MPI and the headcount ratio for different years for all possible cutoffs. So it uses the year 2007 and 2010. All the comparisons are based on the VLSS surveys. So in order to make the comparison actually possible, um, it was necessary to strictly standardize the MPI estimate, <coughs> which meant in that case that child mortality was not used for these specific calculations because it didn't the question didn't come in 2007, so the indicator, the VSAC, this is actually slightly different to the national MPI because we didn't have the data in those years, or they didn't have the data in those years. But anyway, what you can see for both is that independent of the cutoff, poverty is much lower in 2012 than in 2007. And even so, we don't show, they don't show confidence intervals here, the, significant, uh, the reduction is also significant statistically. statistically. The policy use, um, so the government considers the national MPI as one indicator that helps with the allocation of resources to local governments in order to reduce poverty efficiently, and hence it uses the MPI to achieve its goals of the eradication of poverty or the reduction of poverty to below 10% by 2018. And yeah, they seem to be on their way actually. So I guess we're now going on to Sheila. Uh, so to keep going with these national presentations, let me present you a few slides on Chile. Um, for those who know, Chile is a country in South America. It's one of the most developed countries in South America. And apart from Mexico and Colombia, if I'm not wrong, this is the third country in South America that implements a national poverty measure following the Alcar and Foster method. So let's take a look at what Chile has done. Uh, a background in the study. You can find more information on the OP website and also on the multidimensional poverty peer network, that work, which is also the policy network on poverty measurement in multidimensional space, where you can find more information also about the details and the background of each of the country studies. So in the case of Chile, um, it's essentially a country effort that began, if I'm not wrong, with the presidency of um, Bachelet, which is the current president, but the former one. So it would be around maybe five years ago. There was an advisory committee, um, essentially composed by the Ministry of Sustainable Development and the National <coughs> Institute of Statistics. 
So which is interesting for this country is that this is an, um, I would say, an, um, a joint effort of two different units. It's not only the Ministry of Sustainable Development, which is often the one that implements the policy measures, but also the National Institute of Statistics, which is the responsible for collecting the data. Without the data, we cannot really do the measurement. They had a technical report, and this technical report also uh, had the assistance from people from OFI, former colleagues and caring co and colleagues, at all. and then also from CEPAL. CEPAL is the ECLAC, maybe you know it better as the CLAC, which is an institution from the United Nations that does this kind of analysis for Latin America. So there's also a panel of experts, and this is people from Chile, that validated this technical report in August 2013. So from 2013 onwards up to the release of the measure, which if I'm not wrong has been this year. Okay. So these two websites are always useful. In case we <laughs> it should be the one. I think there's no, no battery here. So these two websites are always useful in, in case you are interested in looking at more detail at the press releases of the measure. So looking at the measurement design, if you take a look, we have here four dimensions, which if we, we compare with the global MPI, instead of just having education, health, and living conditions, that is often the case, here we have education, health, labor, and social security, but also housing. Each dimension, which is the abstract concept, has the same weight, 25%. And within each dimension, there are several indicators. So you see, and this is basically my assessment, it's more or less a balanced uh, type of measure. For each dimension, we have three, more or less four indicators. <coughs> Here we have attendance, school backwardness, and schooling, malnutrition in children, health insurance, health care, for labor and social security occupation, social security and pension, which is the retirement pension, and for housing, overcrowding, housing conditions, and basic services. So now the criteria, which are the normative decisions. So you will see that for each of the indicators, there's two things behind. One is the population under the study, which basically determines the type of identification. So here the, the, the deprivation cutoff says a household, the, un the unit of identification, is identified as deprived in education if at least one of its members, and then the sentence continues, in attendance, is not attending an educational institution. And this is valid for people aged 4 to 18 years of age, or 6 to 26 with pe for people with disabilities. But then when we move on to school backwardness, we see that a household would be identified as deprived if at least one of its members is delayed in two or more years in their studies of basic or secondary education. But clearly this indicator is not applying to the entire population, it's only applying to people, or students here, of primary and secondary education. And so on. So for schooling, which is the third one, we see that the population that's been targeted is people age 18 and old. So it varies. Each of the indicators are equally weighted within the dimension, which is 8.3%. So moving on, we have health. Again, the criteria here is a household is identified as deprived if at least one of its members, and then it counts malnutrition in children, is malnourished, at risk of malnutrition, so it's both, overweight or obese. So there's four types of possibilities for this identification here. And the population is children aged zero to six years old. You see, it's very different. It varies across countries. I mean, I'm taking the, the Chile example also for you to learn, but comparing with Bhutan, comparing with Mexico or Colombia that you have heard of, you see there's a slightly different. <laughs> so what is interesting is to look at the overweight which is something we do not find in developing countries, right? But overweight is an issue also for developing countries like Chile, per Peru, or Ali. <laughs> Maybe we live in a couple of years. The type of, 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 of um, the, the way we eat is not really healthy. It's fast food again, but it's not really healthy. So here they are trying to assess that, the malnourishment, risk of malnutrition, but also overweight. So both sides of the distribution of health. If there is a household that is not um, within the population that is relevant, the, the, this criteria is going out, this dimension is going out with the question, so 
you have uh, like um, the other gets higher weight or still zero with this weight? You mean there's a missing observation? There's no response to this question? No. And there's no children. I think that's the case. Yeah. Right? It's the same thing with global and yeah. Yeah, then they are not the product. So going on then health insurance, and then following the same criteria would be for a person in a household not affiliated to the health insurance system or not having any supplementary insurance. And this applies for the entire population, not only children, but the entire population. See, it varies by population. Then for health care, you see, there's basically um, people in households that didn't receive health care in the last three months or had no coverage for this kind of pathology, which I'm not really sure what this means, but it's a pathology in Chile, which I presume is related to an insect. Not really sure. So each of them, again, are equally weighted. We can be measured. And then going forward, we have labor and social security. And within this dimension, there's always three indicators, occupation, social security, and pension. Each of them vary also across populations. For the last one, we people in retirement age. And in contrast, for housing, we still have three indicators, but the, the criteria is not a, as before. Now it says a household is deprived in each housing indicator, if so it's at the household level, it is crowded, live in poor conditions, or the household doesn't have basic sanitation. Then there's this explanation. It's very similar to what we had before. So now, let's look at the results following with these indicators as we did this morning on paper. Now, they have computed the adjusted headcount ratio or the M0. So what do you see from this, uh, from this graph that is maybe catching your attention, referring to our conversation in the morning? What do you find is striking or nothing at all? It's in percentage, right? So I just took the slide from the Fuente Ministerio de Desarrollo Social. So it's just copied and pasted. Just to say that in some cases, we, we said this morning that we shouldn't report the M0, or trusted head calculation, percentage points, rather as an index. But in, nevertheless, they have reported it in percentage. Maybe it's, as, it's easier for a policy maker to understand 6.7% than just an index. Right. Maybe that's the reason. I don't know, but I just wanted to show you as it is. But in looking at the values, clearly from 2009 to 2013, because we did this computation for three different years, there is a clear reduction no? from 6.7, actually it should be 0.06 to 0.04, no? a reduction in multidimensional poverty. Why is they also in the percentage? Um, they say that they have chosen this K value so that they could identify at least one dimension as poor, because they have four. They have four. So they chose this K 25% so that depending which indicators could be, the sum of them would lead to at least one dimension. That was their criteria. But what we often do, and that's what I often do when I do these computations, because I'm not an expert, I mean a national expert, but I look at the distribution. This is the CI vector, this is the population score. I look at the distribution. And you will see whenever you do your own calculations that when you do that, there's some, some, at some point there's a jump, a clear jump that's telling you that there is a difference between these two types of populations, the poor and the non-poor. You will see that. And then you will try to assess in what extent this is 33%, 25%, 40%, something like that. So it, it will give you a clear message of what's happening with the data. So that's a data explanation, clearly, that needs to be complemented normatively. But you will see that. That's often what ha happened to me. So then this result, this is H, only H, you see. This is the percentage of people, people living in multidimensional poverty. So despite having a unit of identification in the household, at the end, we are reporting the percentage of people, meaning all people within the household, identified as poor. You see, you see the difference? One is the unit of identification and the unit of analysis, which is basically people. Is this clear? Yeah. So it's so interesting to see the reduction from 27% this time percentage to 20%. And I think they had in the report whether these differences are statistically significant or not. But let's say, let's, I think they are statistically significant. And they clearly the dimensional breakdown is telling us which of these indicators, and here it's reported in dimensions, are contributing the most 
to multi-dimensional fluid. So what do you see from this graph? Does it, is it telling us something? Do you see yeah. Which is the dimension that contributes the most? It looks like labor, right? Labor and social security. So in 29, it was 32.4%. And in 2013, well, it's still 32.5%. So despite a reduction in the number of people, poor people, multidimensionally, a reduction in the index itself, well, the composition of poverty has not changed in these well, three years. Perhaps it's the time, right? Maybe it's also because variables are stock variables that do not change much. It may be. There's plenty of explanations for that. And then, well, an interesting comparison always is with monetary poverty. So the variable I think here is income, but I've written it as monetary poverty. So you see that um, in blue, we have households living in monetary poverty. So it was 14% to 8% a reduction of more or less 6% between these three years. And then in red, we have the overlap. The percentage of people, households here, households, living in monetary and multidimensional poverty. So we have 8.9, 7.2, and 4.4. You see the overlap? Which is always interesting to see what's happening with consumption or income and the other dimensions, whether they are redundant in that sense. And then by income quintile, and this is interesting because we can see the evolution between the, these the three different years, right? Where, in which quintile do you see this has been the greatest reduction? I mean, the fastest speed in reduction. In the first one, no? It goes from 39 to 30%. And the last one goes from 7% to 3%, which is 4% reduction. Here is 9% reduction, right? So there's more reduction at the, at the beginning, clearly, compared to the highest income quintile. But there's still a reduction, which is good. I mean, it has been reduced everywhere. But it's also striking to see that there is, there is people, households, multidimensionally poor in the highest income quintiles. We should expect maybe, if income is everything, maybe not to find any households there. And we should recall that income is not part of the measure here. It's not an indicator in the measure. So it's not really, I mean, it's giving you a clear picture of what's happening. It's not a fuzzy thing that overlaps. Okay. And then, well, finally, we have this press release, which is essentially comparing these overlaps here with a nice story of how this new measure has been uh, released for Chile. So I think that's all I had for you. And finally, yes, well, we have the composition by regions, but clearly we know that region here is lower, this one, which is region nine, has the highest values of multidimensional poverty. In Chile, for those who know the country, there's more or less it's around the capital, and then some other states are very well, and then there's a high spread between north and south. Clearly, you will find the difference of households and poverty across the country, north and south. So then, I think this is the final part, which uh, I think I will present. Okay, so now you had actually four different examples of um, uh, of countries that have applied the methodology, and and actually, as we have been mentioning many times by now, the methodology is completely flexible, and you could and you are actually going to play around and are going to choose your own dimensions, your own indicators, your own cutoffs and weights when you start working with the data sets that we are going to provide uh, on Thursday and Friday. And, and basically what we, are, what we wanted to show and now in the last few minutes that we have uh, until the end of this session is basically what we first discussed when we are starting to work with a new country. These are four countries that have already implemented and the same uh, methodology has been applied in other contexts. For example, uh, Sabine and Anabash has, have worked with USA to put together a, a women empowerment index in agriculture activities that, ha that is also using the Altair Foster methodology. So it can be used in contexts that are 
outside poverty analysis. And we are also helping some countries to put together uh, measures of targeting, for example, instead of, pover or of a measure of poverty. So this is what we, you, how we usually start when we are talking with countries. And in one of our first conversations, we go a little bit in, in very basic terms. We try to explain which are going to be the basic steps that they're going to need to go through in order to put together their measures. So the first thing to have in, to, like the, to have in mind is that actually to come up with this kind of measure, whether, whether it is a poverty estimate, a poverty measure, or a targeted instrument, a targeting tool, or uh, a happiness index, or a welfare index, in any, whatever the context it is that you're going to use it, you know that uh, when this is happening within a, a government, this is going to involve many actors, many institutions, working with different timings, with different objectives, with different budgets. And that's something that you have to bear in mind. That might seem very obvious, but at the end of the day, it's something essential. We always have many people working, people from the Institute of Statistics that need to coordinate with planning commissions or the Minister of Social Development, and they have different agendas and different goals. And so you need to always keep in mind that you're going to need a lot of uh, coordination skills to put together a measure. And that it's not going to be such a simple or smooth process. You're going to have here around a week, 10 days, to put together a measure and present it. And you're going to already test that coordinating with the rest of your teams. You're going to be around six, seven people per group. And that's already going to take some effort. Imagine when you are actually working in a technical committee that is supposed to put together the national poverty measure for your country. That's really challenging. And you actually need a lot of, um, uh, you actually need a lot of debate and discussion to, to agree on that. Another essential thing to keep in mind is that even though here everybody is going to be learning the techniques, and that's essential, because we want to have a measure that is technically rigorous or correct in, ter in technical terms, we have to bear in mind that if we're working at a national level or, at, uh, uh, or with a government in, or governmental in institution, we actually need that measure to be administratively feasible, and we also need it to be politically implementable. Right? If we're trying to put together a measure that uh, gives us a, that 95% of the population, for example, is multidimensionally poor, politically that would be impossible to actually publish. So we always have to keep these three things in mind. It has to be technically correct, but at the same time we need it to be feasible in political and administrative terms. Now, the way this usually works is that there is going to be a technical team that is going to need to present advances and results and estimates, trial measures, and so on, to a political committee. That is, is, is the way it usually happens. And this is a very sequential process. Usually, first estimates or first numbers are put together. They go to the, commi the political committee. They come back. They keep going and coming back until some agreement has been reached. And so we can start moving forward. But this is going to be a, they're going to be a group that is going to be working mostly on technical issues. And then there's going to be another group that is going to be working mostly on political issues in this type of measures. And those two groups are going to need to be interac interacting the whole time, the whole process. In some countries, the process takes three, four months, like it did in Colombia. And so it was relatively, uh, relatively easy to put together this measure. In other contexts, like in the Chilean case, they were talking and discussing and debating for over four years, for example, to put together the measure. So it could be very different depending on this, uh, how these things are done. Now, the first thing that is essential here is to determine what's the purpose of the measure. And again, as I was saying, um, even if you are putting together a poverty measurement, the objective could be very different. It might be that you want to have a poverty estimate to be able to say, OK, this is the picture of poverty in my country. I want to have, um, I want to have just a description of who's poor, where they are, have a poverty profile available to just be able to describe them. And that's going to lead you to a particular choice in terms of indicators and dimensions and cutoffs. Now, we might want to have a measure that is actually going to be useful to guide policy, that it's going to be able to help government to design new policies. In that case, we need to f choose indicators that are su uh, susceptible or that, are, uh, that can be modified by public policy. If we choose indicators that are actually out of the scope of the government through public policy, 
then the indicator is not actually going to be useful for that purpose that we had in mind. A different purpose would be to target the 20% poorest, the, the poorest 20% of the population, for example, for a particular public policy or a particular anti-poverty program that we want to implement. And in that case, again, we are really trying to focus, to target part of the distribution. So in that case, again, this, th these choices, all these things that we need to choose as part of the methodology are going to be guided mainly by the purpose. So this seems like a very obvious thing, and it's not. This is not. Then it's also, do you want to target the whole population, or do you want to have a child poverty measure, or a measure about women, or a measure that is allowing you to make gender comparisons, or it's just a measure for the elderly? All these things are for uh, indigenous groups, like Colombia has already implemented one. So all these things are actually going to be guiding the process, and it's essential. And you're going to have quite some time to, with your groups to actually come to a conclusion about what do you want the purpose of your measure to be. And then, of course, the normative decisions, and we're going to have a whole session of normative choices and how these are done right after the coffee break, but normative decisions are going to be guiding also the, pro the process. Now, what do we mean by normative decisions? The choice of the dimensions, for example, the choice of the indicators that we're including, the choice of the weights and the cutoffs. Now, in some cases, we're going to guide our process with data as well. But for example, as we were listening from Gisela for the case of Mexico, they had already a law. They had it in the Constitution that there were particular rights that people had the right, <laughs> the, the right to. So in this case, there wasn't much debate about which were the social indicators that they were going to consider, because they were there by law. So in that case, normative decisions can be, gu can be guided by, for example, legislation or national plans. Or they can be based on the opinion of experts. So there are different ways in which we can guide the choice of these normative de the decisions. And Sabine is going to discuss it with Paola after the break. But this is basically going to be the two first things, two very big steps that are going to be needed when we start creating a measure. So to determine the purpose and to actually go through the normative process to come up with the basic definition of wh where we're going. Now, then once we have these decisions, now once that has been made, and we know in some way, or at least you know, we know we have a preliminary set of dimensions, at least, that we want to include in the purpose of the measure, there are going to be three main steps that we are going to follow. And this is where the technical team actually start working. This is where they actually get involved. The first one is to explore potential indicators. The second one is going to be to create, create trial measures, that is to create trial I, uh, MPIs, to create many MPIs. For the global MPI, Sabine and Maria Emma Santos, that were leading the original global MPI in 2010, they started creating eight different MPIs, and they showed them to the UN, and then they come up with another set of MPIs until they actually reach the final one that is published. So it's not that you just come up with one measure and that's the only one that you have. You're going to be actually experimented experimenting quite a lot. And so the third step is going to be to actually analyze what we are getting with these trial measures. So we're going to go through these steps uh, quickly, very briefly, just to, to get an idea of what we're actually doing when we're working with countries. The first thing is that we need to understand what are we putting into the measure, and then we need to understand that because the measure allows for decompositions by subgroups or decompositions by dimensions, we're going to be able to actually get a lot of information back from the measure that we have created. So again, depending on which is the purpose of our measure, we're, we are going to be uh, guided into which indicators to choose and what to incorporate in our measure. Now in this step, what we are actually going to do is to look at what is usually included, what are normative guidelines that we can follow, for example, as James was mentioning yesterday, when we are talking about education, there are so many things that are part of education. There are already some consensus about what education entails. Sc uh, school attendance, quality of employment, uh, years, of, uh, years of schooling. There are so many things that we can look at when we talk about education. Some of these, these things are already, there is already a consensus. So we can already start testing this uh, already accepted or already 
uh, debated and discussed indicators that are traditional in the literature. But we can also guide ourselves with the data that we have available for ourselves. So what we usually do is take the data set that we are going to be using for our measure and actually create what we call the universe of potential indicators. We actually don't restrict our imagination at this point. We take everything we can imagine that we can put together, that we can construct for education, for example, and we put it in a table. And we start creating indicators. We start creating already indicators uh, zero and one, being deprived and non-deprived. And we start already computing what is the proportion of people who is deprived, the uncensored headcounts for each of these potential indicators that we are considering. Initially, we would have a super large table that includes all the potential indicators that we can use, everything that's there. And we would also try to make combinations of things in different ways, because as I was saying, we don't close our minds at this point. Quite the opposite. We try to try everything. So for example, we could consider whether a person can read and whether she or he are able to, um, to write as two different indicators. Or we can create a combined indicator that is considering whether they can do both at the same time or whether they can do one or the other. Now, this may seem very obvious, but at the end, it's something that we actually try to do. We really try to experiment with that to make sure that we are not to analyze, for example, if we, all, we need all these indicators, if we get the same results or not, if they are capturing the same time of, dep of deprivations or not. Another example would be when we are considering quality of the materials that are used for the household. We could have three indicators, what, uh, the material of walls, floors, and roof. Or we could have just one that combines whether the household has bad quality in either one of these, uh, in either the walls, uh, roof, or floor. So we can combine this information, and we, that's what we do at this, in this stage. Now, it's important to also have um, <clears throat> it's important to also have uh, here different deprivation cut off. So, for example, when we are creating indicators of education, we use five years of education, six, seven. We try with different stuff. As I was mentioning, we try here everything that we can imagine, everything. This is not a moment to actually be to try to save space in Excel. It's actually a moment to actually expand and put together everything that could be useful for our measure. We also try to uh, combine information in, sim in different ways to go, for example, from the individual to the household level. So we consider whether no member at all is going to school, if they are uh, school-age children, or whether at least one is going to school, whether a particular proportion of the school-age children are going to school or not, whether, for example, women are going to school or not. And so we make all of this. We make as many uh, indicators as we can create. And then another thing to consider at this point is also to take into consideration what is the proportion of missing values. And so, so then we look, for example, for, uh, uh, at the missing values of these indicators. And we see if there is a particular indicator that has a problem of uh, that very large proportion of missing values. We usually consider 15%, for example, to be a very high proportion of missing values. And that would be one of the criteria that would lead us to consider whether we want to drop or not an indicator. And at the same time, it's crucial, and this is something that you are going to face when you're working with your data, it's crucial to look at what is the applicable population for each of the indicators. And what do we mean, what do we mean by applicable population? If I'm looking at, for example, vaccination for children under five, I have to bear in mind that that information is only going to be available for children under five. So I cannot actually look at the proportion of the population that it's vaccinated because 90% 90, 90 of the population is going to have missing values because they are not under five. And then even if I combine the information at the household level, I'm going to find that many households don't have children under five. So I have to decide what do I do in those cases? Do I drop those households? Do I assume that they are non-deprived because they don't have children so they cannot be deprived in that indicator? Those are decisions that you have to make. And, and that's, that's why, why it's very important, important to, at this point, point not also include the uncensored headcount, but have also very clear in that initial table what's the applicable population, what's the, miss, the proportion of missing values for that applicable population, and to consider exactly what are, exa what are we getting 
with this data. Just to make sure that we are having a good description of what is available and the potential shortcomings of using that. Now, for example, this is not going to be trivial because if I'm considering, for example, uh, vaccinations for children 0 to or 0 5, the applicable population is going to be a very, very, very small proportion of the total population that I'm that I have in the country, right, or in the survey that I'm using. So there are decisions that could be impacted by this. For example, I could decide that because only a small proportion of the population is going to have information on this, that I'm going to give this indicator a very uh, low weight because I don't want to be biasing the final indicator, the final MPI for households that don't have information because they don't have children. So that is something that is, could be considered and so it's important to also have it in mind in this initial stage. And then at this point, we will also add columns in the table, or another sheet, <laughs> another table, in which we are actually computing correlations between indicators, associations, and redundancies. I'm not presenting that now, but actually Sabine and Paola are going to be presenting measures of asso association and correlation between indicators. And this is something that we always do at this stage. Because, for example, in this, when I was talking about the material of wall, floor, and, and roof, do we actually need to have them all in the MPI, or are they giving us the same information? Maybe they are redundant. Maybe if I only include roof, that it's already giving me the same information as having the three of them there. So that's something that I, we would do. And this is the kind of test that we would use, for example, to guide the decision of whether we keep or we draw particular indicators. But then something important to have in mind is that these are going to be, um, they are going to be informing us at this stage. But we are not going to be deciding on dropping a particular indica indicator just based on this. Because again, we are going to contrast what we are getting here against the normative decisions. You might get that floor and roof are highly correlated, that they are redundant. And in spite of that, you might decide that you want to keep both because maybe the government has a particular program that it's aiming at improving uh, floors and another program that it's aiming at improving walls. And so you want to be able to track progress in both things at the same time. Or maybe it's in the Constitution or in particular, a particular legislation. So normative decisions are always going to be informed by these kind of tests, but you're not going to be deciding only or solely based on the test. 